So the reading is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 33, and reading from verse 1. And you'll find it on page 718 in the Church Bible. Woe to you, destroyer, you who have not been destroyed. Woe to you, betrayer, you who have not been betrayed. When you stop destroying, you will be destroyed. When you stop betraying, you will be betrayed. Lord, be gracious to us. We long for you. Be our strength every morning, our salvation in time of distress. At the uproar of your army, the peoples flee. When you rise up, the nations scatter. Your plunder, O nations, is harvested as by young locusts. Like a swarm of locusts, people pounce on it. The Lord is exalted, for he dwells on high. He will fill Zion with his justice and righteousness. He will be the sure foundation for your times, a rich store of salvation and wisdom and knowledge. And the fear of the Lord is the key to this treasure. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Before we look at scripture, let's just pray together. Father God, we just thank you for the words that Isaiah wrote, that you inspired him through your spirit. And Lord, we pray that as we read them, as we look at them together, that you'll speak into our hearts, that we'll hear the promises that you make, and help us, Lord, to get to know you better, and through your our knowledge of you, to stand on the sure foundation of those promises. Amen. Well, do have your Bibles open to page 178 as we look at chapter 33 together. Let me lead you, read you a list of current conflicts in the world where over 1,000 people have been known to have been killed last year alone. The Yemeni crisis, it's still ongoing, 20,882. Mexican drug war, which you don't hear about often, ongoing, 35,538. Syrian civil war, ongoing, 11,215. The Afghan conflict, ongoing, 41,735. The Somali civil war, ongoing, 2,637. All those deaths in 2019 alone. If you go to the start of those conflicts, they go into the hundreds of thousands. And though there's a few of them, there's loads more conflicts in the world today. Loads more deaths each year. Across the world, men and women kill each other in the name of freedom, of peace, and of power. Evil seems to flow like an ever-ending stream when you see those lists. And of course, we're, we're not immune from it in the UK, for, for example. You know, the Streatham stabbings in London in February 2020, two people wounded. Whitmore prison stabbings, Cambridge, January 2020, that's this year. Again, two people wounded again. London Bridge, November 19, two dead. L London Bridge, set, June 17, three dead. Manchester Arena, May 17. 22 dead, 139 injured. And again, they're just a, a sample of the terrorist activities and the killings that take place in this country alone. And you know, as we read about those things in the, the UK, we have to realize that those people didn't, who did those horrible deeds didn't grow up, up in Afghanistan. They didn't grow up in dangerous places. They grew up in dangerous places like Stoke-on-Trent or Tunbridge Wells or Manchester. You see, we live in a country where we don't just lock everything, but we fit everything with an alarm. We don't feel safe walking on our own streets. We don't feel, don't feel safe at night, do we, very often? See, this is a world we're in, living in which is run by humanity. It's a world where we seem to be losing the fight to, to make things better. But God has promised he's going to sort it out. 
He's going to sort it out one day if we just trust him. Now, of course, this was the experience uh, of the people of Judah at the time of Isaiah. And their prospects looked pretty bleak in a, in a world of evil, a world just like today's world, really. They've decided in their wisdom that they could defy their overlord, Assyria, the great superpower of the day. Of course, the problem was that, as Isaiah writes, and look, the mass divisions of the Assyrian army are, are bearing down upon this small country of Judah, and they're encamped. They're encamped around them, and God offers help. But no, they think Egypt looks a better bet than God. So God says, okay, I'll give you what you want. I'll give you what you want. You trust in that fading power of Egypt. If that's what you want to do, then that's what you'll get. You'll get Egypt. But if you do, you're going to be smashed. The Assyrians are going to attack you. But at the last minute, when the enemy is literally at the gates of Judah's capital, Jerusalem, and the people can smell the cooking from the fires of the camps around the gates, they suddenly have a change of heart and they turn to God. And as Ian said last week, we'll get to that incident after Easter as we, we look at chapters 36 and 37. But here in Isaiah chapter 33, that's the actual incident that Isaiah has in mind as he writes this chapter. He's thinking about what's going to happen. And he tells us that it's never too late to turn back to God. And that's because of who God is. So this morning, God's saying to, to you and to me, you know, if you've been rejecting me, if you've let evil come as far as your gate, and you feel helpless, come back to me. Come back to me. If you've been paying lip service and living for yourself, come back to me. Turn around. If you're trusting in anyone or anything to provide purpose and security in your life and a hope for the future, a future that's without evil, well then, come back to me. Come back to me. For God says, first of all, that he is not coming up. That's it. <laughs> he is the Lord, our strength and salvation in verses 1 to 6. And we see the, also the end of the enemy in these verses. Look at verse 1. Woe to you, destroyer. You have not been destroyed. Woe to you, betrayer. You who have not been betrayed. When you stop destroying, you'll be destroyed. When you stop betraying, you'll be betrayed. See, we're now at the last of the six woes of Isaiah, the first of which we came across in chapter 29. Now, the woe we see here isn't directed directly to Judah, the rebellious people of God, but rather to Syria, their enemy. Now, Assyria, they might have been bold and brash and unbeatable, but when they come face to face with the living God, they'll find out who really does run the world. Syria went around destroying people's lives, so God says to them, you're going to be destroyed. Syria betrayed nations, not least of all Judah, but the betrayer, God says, you'll be betrayed. And he was. Sennacherib, the Assyrian king at this time, tried to trick Hezekiah, king of Judah. But when he returned home, his campaign having failed, and which we'll read about later on, as we said earlier, when he returned home, he was killed by his own sons. The betrayer was betrayed. You see, sooner or later, evil rebounds on those who practice it. Do you know that the police would tell you that often witnesses don't turn up to court cases, and that's largely because the witnesses, the witnesses actually as dodgy as the person being tried, because a lot of cases are about criminals who've attacked or burgled another criminal. A drug dealer knives another drug dealer. A gang member assaults another gang member. They steal stolen goods from one another. See, evil rebounds upon those who practice it. And... Yes, even the evil in our own lives doesn't work either. I mean, how many arguments have you had that actually work out? That actually made you feel better afterwards? How many lies have you told 
And we all, tell, we all know that we've told lies, but how many lies have we told that didn't make things worse at the end of them? You see, however tricky you are, there's always someone who's going to be a little bit trickier than you. However powerful you are, there's always somebody more powerful than you. And in the end, he or it is called the law. And it's God's law that's more powerful. So with the Assyrians building their siege towers, the people cry out to God in verse 2. Lord, be gracious to us. We long for you, they say. You see, God's record is one of grace. It's, pour, it's pouring his undeserved love on, on his people. And, and Judah knew that. They knew it. They'd experienced it over their history. They'd seen God's love poured out time and time again. And we can read about it as we, as we go through the Old Testament. So even at the last minute, they know that God is still gracious. They long for him. They literally wait for him. They've come to the point where there's no one else to wait for, you see. Their Egyptian allies have been destroyed. Their army is pathetic. And so they go on in verse 2b. Be our strength every morning, our salvation in times of distress, God. See, in morning, of course, is the time the attack would be launched. And there's a sense of desperation in them. These people, they don't need help. They need saving. They need a savior. You know, it's only when you realize that you can't help yourself, that there's nothing that you can do to get rid of the evil or the wells up in your own heart, let alone to cope with the evil in the world around us. It's only when you know that your only hope is the Lord that you'll actually turn to him and come back. Now, dependence tends to be a bit of a dirty word in our society, doesn't it? We, we, champion, thing, we champion self, self in confidence, self-made, self-assured. The sort of person who goes out and wins the apprentice. You know the sort. But it's only when you realize that you are totally dependent on God that you'll find true strength. And so verse 3, at the uproar of your army, the people flee. When you rise up, the nations scatter. You see, God only must speak, and the bravest army runs away. The battle's over before it even starts. In verse 4, you plunder, o nation, your plunder, O nations, is harvested. And that was Judah's experience. Now, here's a trailer for after Easter when we look at uh, Isaiah 37. Isaiah 37, verse 36 says, Then the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 in the Assyrian camp. When the people got up the next morning, there were all the dead bodies. Huh. You see, trusting God works because of who he is. He is the all-powerful one. And look what he promises in verse 5. The Lord is exalted, for he dwells on high. He will fill Zion with his justice and righteousness. Now, of course, Zion, you see, was the, was the hill in the center of Judah's capital, Jerusalem, wasn't it? It's where God's temple was, and it stands for the, the perfect place where God's people will be with him forever. Their lives are going to be filled with justice. There will be no more evil. Only God's perfect loving rule and righteousness. It will be a, a loving rule that all people will want to obey. It will be a safe place. It will be a safe place filled by the Lord, verse 6. He will be the sure foundation for your times, a rich store of salvation and wisdom and knowledge, the fear of the Lord is the key to this treasure. The Lord himself is the rock in times of trouble. The Lord is the rock. The unshakable certainty in a world of confusion that we live in. The God who speaks and acts faithfully throughout history. He is the one. He is the one who saves his people again and again. He gives his people wisdom on how to live. It's in, it's in your Bible. It's in front of you. God's wisdom. He tells his people the knowledge of who he is so that we can get to know him 
Those are the treasures of knowing God. That's what anyone who fears the Lord can have, the Bible tells us, because fear here isn't an emotion. It isn't about being terrified about God or of God. What it is is the gift of a relationship with God. It's the key to all the other treasure that God pours out upon us. And you see, the word Lord is in capitals in verse 5 and then again in verse 6. And it's because that's God's covenant name, a name that reminds Israel that he chose them and that he loves them and he's stuck with them through thick and thin. And when we see the name Lord in capitals, it reminds us that God has chosen us today and he sticks with us through thick and thin. And sometimes we ignore that. And Israel ignored it. Judah ignored it. But despite that, he hasn't deserted them. He longs for them to return, to come back. The Lord is our strength and salvation. Not because we've won his favor or earned his help, but simply because he is a gracious, loving, merciful God. And the people of Judah, they cry out to him. The problem is, they don't deserve his rescue. They, don't, they deserve to face, secondly, the Lord's consuming fire, in verses 7 to 16. Now, it's not politically correct, is it, to talk about God judging the world, but the Bible's very clear that God takes evil so seriously that he punishes it both now and in the future. And if we want God to save us and the world, we need him to judge evil. I mean, young women only go out in our cities today because serial killers like Sutcliffe and rapists like Sananga were found guilty and sentenced to life. Evil must be dealt with, dealt with if we're going to feel safe, mustn't it? So when people, to make you feel better, say, oh, it's not the end of the world, Perhaps we should reply, well, that's a shame, isn't it? Because on that day, on that last day, God will put everything right. He will remove all sin and suffering. There will be a, a final judgment, and it will all be cleared up, and we will all feel safe. The first Isaiah describes our present hopelessness. In the, look at verse 7. Look there, brave men cry aloud in the streets. The envoys of peace weep bitterly. The soul, you see, the soldiers are so scared, they actually scream like girls watching as a horror movie. Diplomats shed tears because their negotiations have proved totally useless. That was the fate of King Hezekiah and the soldiers of Judah. They thought they could find an ally who would help, but in the end, nothing could stop Assyria. In case you haven't noticed, Governments don't work either. Human plans to sort out the world fail because that's what governments try to do. I mean, if governments did work, we'd have a single party rule, wouldn't we? Because every time there's a general election, we'd like we'd elect the same people again and again. Boris might like to think that. You know, you're doing such a good job, keep at it. But governments don't work. And they don't work because of the selfishness of sin in the human heart. It means that human rule of the world is never going to work. Governments don't work. Verse 8. The highways are deserted. No travelers are on the roads. The treaty is broken. Its witnesses are despised. And no one is respected. The streets are cleared by fear, and sooner or later the promises are broken, and the politicians are hated. Notice verse 8 at the end. No one is respected. You see, those who have no regard for God finally have no regard for their fellow humans. It's the way of the world. It's the way the world's going today. And so what dominates our attitude to other people increasingly is, is fear, not respect. So we no longer get up for the old person on the bus. But we do cross the street to the other side if we see there's a group of young people wearing hoodies. 
That's what fear does. That's what fear does. It turns us against each other. Makes us see things which perhaps aren't there. And we don't respect people as a result. We don't do what the police officer says because they're a police officer. We do what they say because we fear the consequences of disobeying them. Not out of respect. Because because of the consequences. You see, if you don't respect God, very quickly you respect nobody. And the Bible says that the world is like this because, as Paul says in Romans chapter 1, verse 18, the wrath of God has now actively been revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. See, it's not just that we are incompetent, it's that we're under God's judgment because we've all rejected the truth. The truth that there is a loving creator who deserves to be worshipped. And so Paul goes on in Romans, he says this, Therefore God gave them over to the sinful desires of their hearts. See, God gives us what we want. He lets our selfishness run rampant. He's given us a world where we can be in control and the result isn't just the news on our television or the screens on our websites. It's the pain we suffer in our lives as well as a result where people suffer and so does the rest of creation. Verse 9, the land dries up and wastes away. Lebanon is ashamed and withers. Sharon is like the Arabah and Bashan and Carmel drop their leaves. You see, it's a withered world. It's a dying world, a world that physically doesn't work because of humanity. A world where the Rose of Sharon is like the desert of Arabah. Because God hasn't just given us over to our sin. He hasn't just given us over to our sin. Out of his great love, God has cursed creation so that we can spot there's something wrong. So when we hear of climate change, when we see trees being desiccated in the rainforests, and we see the wars I've been talking about, that should tell us that there's something wrong in the world. God has wired the world so that we suffer the consequences of our sin, and he's done it so that we can see our sin as well. But the good news is it's not going to be like that forever because God loves his world, so there will be a future judgment. Verse 10. Now will I arise, says the Lord. Now will I be exalted. Now will I be lifted up. We've already seen that God rescued Judah at the 11th hour. But this is bigger than that. What he's talking about here is is a global rescue, which everyone needs, which we all need. Because look at how successful our plans are to run the world. Not very successful at all, are they? In fact, they're disastrous. Look at verse 11a. You conceive chaff, you give birth to straw. People doing their utmost best, thinking their hardest, being most realistic, practically applying their collective wisdom to all the hard questions of life, but leaving God out. They're like chaff and straw. They're like chaff and straw, burnt in an instant, the waste products of the harvest. And what does the second half of verse 11 say? Your breath is a fire that consumes you. Now, this isn't a case of bad breath. This is the fact that the people's plans are their downfall. They leave us open to the righteous anger of God, the God that we've chosen to ignore. And we almost bring ourselves under God's judgment as we talk about things that excite us, what really matters in our life, our hopes and our joys. We show that our hearts are fixed on self-worship. What's going to benefit us? What are we going to get out of it? That's what we concentrate on. Our hearts are the fountains of sin. And it's a message everybody needs to hear in verse 13. You who are far away, hear what I have done. You who are near, acknowledge my power. And when faced 
with this consuming fire of God's judgment, there's only one question to ask. Look at verse 14. The sinners of Zion are terrified. Trembling grips the godless. Who of us can dwell with the consuming fire? Who of us can dwell with everlasting burning? See, that's the problem, isn't it? We like the idea of God judging the world and ridding it of evil. But Judah, his people, recognize also that they deserve his judgment as well. I mean... Could you stand before the Holy God and have not just your public sins exposed, but have the secrets of your heart laid bare and then say, I don't think I deserve God's righteous anger. It's not me. Imagine what it would be like to have your sins publicly displayed each week. You could come out one by one and run through them. We could put them on the screen up here at the same time to make sure you didn't get away with them. How would you feel? You'd perhaps feel a little less self-righteous, wouldn't you? So no wonder the sinners of Zion are terrified. No wonder Judah's terrified. Trembling grips the godless. And that should be our attitude whenever we think of our sin and we think of what we actually deserve from God. And we already know the answer to that question, don't we? That's why they're terrified. Who can dwell with the consuming fire. Well, no one can dwell with the consuming fire. Who can dwell with everlasting burning? No one. Verse 15, those who walk righteously and speak what is right, who reject gain from extortion and keep their hands from accepting bribes, who stop their ears against plots of murder and shut their eyes against contemplating evil. Only that sort of person can stand the sort of person whose every action is in line with God's word in the Bible. The sort of person who speaks every, whose every word is truth, who doesn't desire personal gain. The sort of person who won't even entertain an unkind thought about another person. Who can bear? The sort, of, sort of person who can't bear to look upon evil. And we have to say, are we like that? Is that us? Are you like that? I think we would all have to say, no, we're not. We can't stand because we're not like that. Our hearts just aren't. Only a person like that, though, can dwell before the Lord. According to verse 16, a person like that deserves the Lord's protection and blessing. Do you know, one of the problems of the world is that we like to think we are part of the solution. In fact, we're just part of the problem of the world. As Christians, we know and believe that our sin brings us under God's judgment, and yet we continue to trivialize our sin with our own self-righteousness. We, we're so quick to try and justify ourselves very often rather than to realize that we are guilty before the Lord, the consuming fire. And we need to admit that daily, that we are in the wrong sometimes, that we get it wrong. But there's nothing we can do about it either both to deal with the evil from within or from the evil without. So we desperately need, lastly, the Lord, our beautiful King, in verses 17 to 24. See, this is the word of promise the people of Judah need here. They're not just facing a terrible human enemy, but they know they deserve the burning anger of God. And into the middle of that terror, God says verse, in verse 17, Your eyes will see the king and his beauty and view a land that stretches afar. A beautiful king, we're told, will take them to an abundant land, a land of peace, such peace that they're, they're sort of left stunned with the wonder of the place. Do you see that in verse 18? In your thoughts you will ponder the former terror. Where is the chief officer? Where is the one who took the revenue? Where is the officer in charge of the towers? You see, it's all happened so quickly they can't quite believe the enemies have disappeared from the gates of Jerusalem. Where are they? Where have they gone? But God says in verse 19, huh, forget about them. I've dealt with them. I've done it. Those strange-speaking Assyrians, you're not going to see them again. Verse 20. Look on Zion, the city of our festivals. Your eyes will see Jerusalem, a peaceful abode, a tent that will not be moved. Its stakes will never be pulled up, nor any of its ropes broken. Doesn't life 
sometimes feel like one long disastrous camping trip. You know, you're just getting up the tent before another storm sweeps in and it's blown down. God's people wandered around the desert for ages. From one, they stumbled from one disaster of disobeying God to another. But God says the long journey of life will be over. The stumbling around will come to an end. No longer will you have to face the next change. No longer will you have to keep moving on. You're going to be safe in the hands of God who's made you and who loves you, verse 21. There's the Lord. There the Lord will be our mighty one. It will be like a place of broad rivers and streams. Rivers of abundance, he says. Rivers of and no foreign invader will ever get up. And there's no doubt as to why this place is so wonderful. Do you see what's repeated four times in verses 21 and 22? The Lord will be our mighty one. The Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. It is he who will save us. This is where the Lord's going to rule perfectly. He's going to save them, bring them to this place. Of course, this was never fulfilled in the history of Judah, was it? They never had a king who was actually beautiful enough to, to rescue them like this, to rescue them from their enemies and from themselves, to take them permanently into God's presence. Because, you see, for that to happen, then there needed to be a king who was also the Lord, the perfect judge, the one who took God's judgments so that his people didn't have to. The perfect lawgiver who not only told his people how to live but promised to change their hearts so that they would want to live like that. The perfect king who walked through his creation commanding storms to be stilled and illnesses to be gone. The king who took the full heat of that consuming fire. The full heat on his own, of his own righteous anger against our sin. The king who could be the strength of his people because he knew what he was to live like a man. The king who could be the savior of his people because his perfect life could be given in place of their sin, given on the cross at Calvary for you and for me. The beautiful the perfect king, the Lord Jesus Christ. You won't find a more beautiful king. He can, bring, he can be your strength every morning and your salvation in times of stress. He will help you to live through the mess of this world that's riddled with sin and he will take you through to God's final judgment on that last day, safe and secure into that new Jerusalem. And the question for all of us, whether you're with Christ, whether you're walking away from him, or whether you're stumbling along like a lot of us, following him, the question for all of us is, will you trust him? Will you trust him? It's been repeat, the repeated questions as we've gone through the book of Isaiah. Because there are two choices which is spelt out in verses 23 and 24 as we finish. And here's one. Look at verse 23a. Your rigging hands, hangs loose. The mast is not held secure. The sail is not spread. You see, life for Judah, not trusting God, is like being on a ship without rigging, without a, a rudder blown this way and that way in the wind, the mercy of powerful currents of the world, powerful nations, hopeless and helpless. And that's what life is without Jesus. We're walking, we're all a walking human wreck. We're incapable of sorting out our own problems alone. We're like a ship without sails, blown, blown this way and that. And if you don't realize that now, then the Lord will use your circumstances of life to teach you that, to point it out. And asking you to turn and come back. And he does that because he loves you. He loves you. And he won't let you trust in yourself forever. 
And then here's another one. If we trust in the Lord Jesus, he promises to take us home to a a port that's like no other. Look at verse 24. No one living in Zion will say, I am ill, and the sins of those who dwell there will be forgiven. You see, he's going to take us into God's presence where the pain of this world will be a thing of the past and and the evil of this world is going to be destroyed and set aside and judged and condemned. And the battle, just like the Assyrian army outside the gates of Jerusalem, will disappear. It'll be gone. It'll be over. It'll be won. And we will be forgiven. So, the question is, will you trust the beautiful king to get you through the battle of life? Will you, will you pray the prayer of verse 2? Lord, be gracious to us. We long for you. Be our strength every morning, our salvation in the time of distress. Will you pray that prayer? Because if you will, then you, you will know that the Lord is everything in verses 21 and 22, that he is the judge, that he is our lawgiver, that he is the one who saves us. But above all, you'll know that he is the beautiful king.